Today we'll be focusing on case conceptualization, client goals, and values. Oftentimes individuals enter addiction treatment in their most vulnerable moments. They're looking for long-term goals that will support change and recovery. On that road to recovery, there are often many gaps to overcome, and we need to find a bridge to fulfill the road to recovery that's meaningful and connecting to those long-term goals. In order to do so, we must understand that the values that the person has and those values must align with the treatment goals to help ensure the effectiveness of the treatment and long-term outcomes. When we explore values and goals, we're doing a lot of work around helping to identify, reflect, and continue to explore. And this is a pattern that will happen throughout the treatment episode in a number of ways. We can engage in open-ended questions of various complexity, meaning each individual is going to present at their own unique stage of change and also in terms of their health and well-being. What they're able to comprehend and how they're able to communicate and engage will depend on where they're at in their recovery process. So making open-ended questions fit for where we are in the here and now with keeping in mind where we're going in the then and there. We're able to be very intentional about the application of techniques and approaches, motivational interviewing skills, such as evoking change and eliciting response, affirmations, reflections, all very intentional and meaningful in order to help improve the therapeutic alliance and the long-term success of the treatment episode. We want to help enhance awareness of core values. So making sure that we're reframing information back to clients when they're saying something that's of value or of meaning to them and giving us a sense of who they are as an individual while they continue to go through self-exploration. There are certain things that we're going to store in our memory bank. It might not be meaningful in the here and now, or the person might not be ready to explore that at a deeper level right now. But certain values are going to come up around supports, loved ones, what's meaningful in their life, interests and hobbies that they want to get back to. So we can always take note of that and be sure to circle back when it's a more appropriate time or to use it in a way to reflect, reframe, and affirm change overall. We're going to promote self-actualization as we reflect back on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We want to ensure that those needs are being met and we're helping to engage with individuals in such a way that they feel like there's hope and that change is occurring. Some structured interventions that can help with value exploration and goal setting include a card sort. Here you might be able to create cards with individuals and have them label values on each card. We could do this collaboratively, we could do it as part of a group, you could assign it as homework, but ultimately the end game goal is to prioritize these cards. Let's look at some values that are most significant to us and make some sense out of them and help to better understand how they apply to our view of self and others in the world. How can they align with our overall goals? Or is there some incongruity there? And what does that mean for our ability to attain goals if there is incongruence? Also, personality characteristics. Oftentimes people become who they are as an addict and they think that that's all encompassing. Or on the reverse, people think recovery is all encompassing. It's part of one experience. So helping identify what I like, what I don't like, what holds meaning to me, what are my interests today, what I used to do that might be beneficial to get back into. You know, how do we engage in some cognitive mapping to help align characteristics with the who we are and our ideal self? Or even this concept of this is most like me, this is least like me, I like this, I don't like that, and allowing individuals a safe space to explore their own characteristics as it evolves and changes throughout a recovery process. This might be something that we want to check in with them about because what they come in with terms of characteristics or values today might not be the same three months from now. I used to work in this long-term residential substance use treatment center for women, so often we needed to consider in which the ways that their addiction had shaped their lives, but also the ways in which trauma had shaped addiction. And oftentimes these women would come in on day one or day two and not feel like they had a really good concept of who they were or what they liked. Giving them as much intentional choice as possible is so helpful for them to start reclaiming who they are and what they like and don't like. Sometimes it's as simple as in group therapy. If I had 10 people that I was expecting and then me, I make 11, I'm going to make sure that there are at least 13 chairs in the circle so that everybody, even the last person joining, still has a choice of where they would prefer to sit. 
these things can seem like small details for us to pay attention to, but can really start to do some deep work with our clients and their ability to start to rebuild their sense of self. So we continue to go back and make our own intentional and meaningful choices about the treatment that we're providing, and then encourage our clients to also be making intentional and meaningful choices to build a recovery process that's effective and successful. When we're checking for congruence or incongruence, we know that when we look in the mirror, we want to make sure that what we see aligns with our values. If there's incongruence, there, that needs to be explored through the treatment episode and to determine where the work needs to be done to best align with the values and goals. When we talk about this, it's to live with integrity. It's to behave in a manner that's consistent with and fulfills one's core values. So when we talk about integrity of who we are, oftentimes people suffering from addiction have a wealth of shame and guilt built up based on past experiences. Sometimes bridges have been burned with families and loved ones, and maybe they acted out of character. They did things for their addiction that they never would have done had they not been in their addiction. So how do we help them heal in this recovery process? By holding on to some of the motivational interviewing concepts and allowing them to explore that and guide them through the process of change. The discrepancy between current behavior and core values can be a powerful motivator for change when explored in a safe and supportive atmosphere. Instead of directly confronting a discrepancy, which is likely to evoke self-defeating language and behavior, implement ORs. So historically, drug and alcohol treatment has been very confrontational. Some 12-step meetings, such as AA, are confrontational in manner, and that's that they're addressing things as they pop up in the moment. And confrontation can be very, very positive when it's done in an appropriate fashion. We want to avoid those ruptures to therapeutic alliance, but we do want to help confront any incongruence in a way that's meaningful and intentional. And we can do that by using or, so open-ended questions, affirming, reflection, summarizing. This will allow the individual to engage in their own self-exploration with our support. And I stuck a quote up here from the poet W.H. Auden that Vanderkolk refers to in The Body Keeps the Score as the Auden Rule. And I think it's appropriate to consider here. Truth, like love and sleep, resent approaches that are too intense. Think of times when you've been confronted with the truth too strongly and weren't ready to hear it yet and did everything you could to fight back. Or the more that you force yourself to go to sleep, the less sleep you'll surely get that night. It can't be forced. We must bring truth in softly, gently, lovingly. We're not here to tell someone about themselves. We're here to help them unlock themselves. When we talk about focusing, we want to help seek and maintain a direction through the addiction counseling process. This will help them develop an agenda that includes hopes, fears, expectations, and concerns. And the agenda might be set up on a short-term basis or a long-term basis, potentially, and probably both. Agendas might be set for each individual session, and we might be curious about where the client wants to start that day. We might be able to summarize some goals and values that they've discussed in the past, or just explore some interests like, what's most significant for you today? What are you feeling like talking about, or what's important for you to discuss today? How can I help you get through these next few sessions in a way that's feeling meaningful and intentional for you? So remember your four styles of focus. They very much matter not your four styles. There's only three. I don't know what I'm saying, but are we engaging in that directive focus? Are we following? Are we guiding? And as you remember in earlier lectures, we talked about that ebb and flow here and the different techniques involved in each. This is also based on your style as a counselor and what's a good fit for you. Are you more directive or more laissez-faire? But most importantly, adapting to the client's presenting needs is what we're going to need to be doing, not just sticking with one style because it's easy or comfortable for us. And sources of focus include the client, the situation or the context, and the clinical experience, clinical expertise. We will also see some ebb and flow between this, and we'll include the use of motivational interviewing skills for healthy communication patterns. So we want to focus to come from the client as much as possible. We want to help guide, direct, or follow that. Sometimes situations being described are very important and we're going to help redirect the client's experience and how that made them feel, what activating events occurred, and looking at some skills, some coping strategies or expectations 
to what created the problem, what helped us resolve the problem, and how do we look at these things as an opportunity for growth and change. But the clinical expertise, there will be times, of course, that we're going to be engaging in some psychoeducation or referring the client to other resources that might be helpful to them. Focusing challenges include tolerating uncertainty, and this can be very challenging for not only the client, but also for the counselor as we look at transference and countertransference. There's a lot of fear with the unknown and uncertainty, and with addiction counseling specifically, we want to help people gain the belief and trust within themselves to step out with blind faith and take a chance at the recovery process. What that means to them is going to be different for each and every individual, but be able to tolerate uncertainty and cope and sustain through that is very significant for a long-term recovery success story. Sharing control. Again, we're not the expert, but we want to have a balanced relationship, and that includes but not limited to setting healthy boundaries. The counselor is becoming a positive role model in the person's life, so we want to model a secure attachment and healthy boundaries. We also want to help search for strengths and openings for change. Remember that with ambivalence and problems, there's always solutions involved. Often people have their own set of skills that they just simply don't recognize in the moment. So we want to look at those expectations or those exceptions to the problems and ways that we can identify healthy coping to engage in long-term sustainable recovery. So what's an example of a time when you felt like you were able to do that better? What skills, what tools were you using then? And we're going to have to change direction if somebody continues to blame, project, deflect away, focus from self. We're going to have to redirect that in a meaningful way that's tactful and very skillful. We don't want it to be a negative confrontation, but we do want to help individuals reflect back on how it was affecting them or simply say to them, you know, today I thought your focus was to address X, Y, and Z, but it seems as those were starting to focus more on ABC here. Is there something else going on that you would like to talk about? And that would be an example of using confrontation in a session. They've identified their values and desires and we're pointing out the incongruence between the value and the behavior. Another example in that scenario would be, we're starting to focus a lot on this and I know that's not what was part of your agenda today. So how can we redirect this conversation in a way that's going to be most meaningful to you? Getting stuck in those therapeutic ruptures. We're always going to have those low points in counseling sessions. There might be days that the counselor is walking away and feeling as though they didn't do the best they could. There might be days that the client's walking away feeling worse than they did when they came into the room. It's okay to acknowledge that sessions will be challenging, yet being able to get through this in a positive manner will be one of the most rewarding things that that person has experienced, whether that's the counselor or the person in recovery. Not giving up just because it gets difficult It builds strength for them and for you. Addressing difficult topics. Again, they're going to come up. We must recognize that it's going to be challenging and to have an empathetic understanding of what that can be. We can help normalize these concepts and recognize that it's difficult to discuss this. I see that you're having a difficult time with this reflection of an experience. How can I help support you? What needs to happen so that you can feel safe right now? What are coping skills that you can use to get through difficult times like this? Because you're committed to change and I've seen your efforts result in some significant change that's been beneficial to you and your loved ones. And also with clarifying roles, sometimes in addiction counseling, people who are addicted might want to test the counselor. They might have a grandiose personality. And with that, we need to find ways to balance out that equation and balance our roles by engaging in some role clarification. We might engage in some role play where we're asking the individual to change places with us. We're asking to take each other's roles to see how we can better communicate. So you can be very creative here and how to clarify roles. It doesn't have to be a negative confrontation, but it can be a very positive one that allows us to work through challenging times in a productive manner. When we talk about agenda mapping and motivational interviewing, we must be able to assess for the person in their stage of change, look at the values they have, and the ultimate goals of where do they want to see themselves. So this question that we're answering here is how do we help them get there? This is a great agenda map that can explore what an individual wants to achieve. Do they have an idea of what that is or are they unsure or not ready to explore it at this time? If so, how do we continue down this format to get them to the end result that's going to best fit with where they are today? 
a smart behavioral plan goes to the concept of specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time-bound goals. So how do we target those goals that are most realistic for individuals? We don't want to set people up for failure by setting up goals that don't match with their values, that aren't measurable, that aren't specific, or aren't realistic. Within what time frame might we be able to achieve a goal? Again, individuals experiencing addiction have immediate gratification tendencies, so recovery can't come soon enough. We need to be able to assess what's an appropriate time frame. What are some of the objectives that we have to achieve and action steps in order to achieve these long-term goals? Eliciting commitment statements can be part of this. How confident do you feel on a scale of 1 to 10 here? Scaling is another questioning technique that if individuals are saying, I'm feeling pretty confident, then you might say like, can you describe to me on a scale of one to 10, how confident you feel? My confidence level is a seven. Great. Then we're going to move forward with your plan. What is it going to take to get you to an eight? If a confidence level seems a little lower, we might want to look at it as maybe moving from like a 0.2 to a 0.6. So you're saying you're feeling at a 0.2. What makes you not a zero right now? So motivational interviewing techniques can help apply to value exploration, agenda mapping, and goal setting throughout an entire treatment episode in a very effective and intentional way. And of course, with everything, we always have to consider our ethical considerations. So this is in term of client or clinician aspirations. When we're talking about agenda setting, we must be very careful to look at whether this is the goal of the client or the goal of the counselor. Is this your hope for the client or is this theirs? Maybe it's both. Hopefully, ideally, it's both. So there's this nice continuum here that will help you guide your understanding of where that falls and potentially what that's about for you as a clinician or for the client. Maybe the client really doesn't know and they're just looking for somebody to give them the answers. However, that's not going to be effective for them in the long run. We really want to help them gain autonomy and have a voice in their treatment and their recovery process. So let's gauge this in a very ethical way and help evoke change from the individual's perspective. The counselor's expertise may come into play, no doubt, but we ultimately want the client to help, want the client to be setting the goals. So here's a discussion question for the week. There's multiple opportunities where I hint at this one through the lecture. So if you haven't considered answering it yet, consider it now. How do you stay aware of the difference between your goals for the client and the client's goals? We also will then work with them to, of course, make sure that it's specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and within this target time frame that's going to work best based on the individual's presenting needs. So for instance, something that might fall into the B area would be if a client comes to see you and reports that they have a history of binge drinking alcohol and smokes about a pack a day, and they're saying, I really want to stop drinking altogether. Great. But then you say, you know what? We're also going to work on your smoking habits too. And they say, no, no, I'd really just love to focus on drinking right now. And you say, well, if you're going to quit one thing that's unhealthy, you might as well quit it all. So, you know, it's just a logical decision. Your intention is to help. Yet, do you see where it might go wrong? Do you see where you might lose them? We don't want to be in the business of setting goals on behalf of our clients. And then in six months, be scratching our heads saying, gee, I wonder why they're so resistant to change. We also know in terms of ethical considerations, there are four ethical key concepts that we will always hold true in the counseling profession. Non-malfeasance is to do no harm. We do not want to lead clients down a path of our intention and create more harm for them. We want to hear their experience. We want to help elicit change and affirm from a strength-based, trauma-informed care perspective. We want to include our expertise as appropriate to help guide. We also want to ensure that this is about the client's overall welfare, their safety. We're engaging in risk assessment. We're ensuring that they have a safety plan. We're looking at resources and ancillary supports that are most effective for individuals, as well as those high-risk people, places, and things, developing coping strategies to counteract such high-risk situations. With autonomy, the respect for humans, freedom, and dignity, risks and benefits to treatment, as part of our assessment process, we should always be talking to our clients about the risks and benefits of treatment. We should be talking to them about levels of care, our clinical recommendations for a particular level of care. However, that client might be saying, you want me to do partial partial hospitalization or go to inpatient or detox? I can't do that. I can't do that because of my family, because of my job. I don't have childcare. Who's going to pay the bills? I don't have anybody to watch my dog. 
So then we talk about what they can do because this is important. So potentially maybe the language here is least restrictive level of care. And with that, we're going to say, okay, ultimately I'm recommending this higher level of care based on your presenting needs. However, I hear you can't do that. And I don't want to set you up for failure by saying it's my way or the highway. So we're going to engage in least restrictive outpatient level of care. And here's some risks of doing that. Here's some benefits of doing that. Ultimately, we're collaborating with the client about their treatment. Overall, we want to respect one another, use non-judgmental approach, unconditional positive regard, and treat people with fairness. Case conceptualizations will play into the values, goals, and treatment planning. And as we assess their needs, we're looking at ethical considerations along the way. We're helping to engage in self-exploration around values and goals. We want to engage in case conceptualization that will act as a bridge between assessment data and comprehensive treatment planning. So the case conceptualization is our hypothesis of what the presenting needs of the individual are. So we want to employ motivational interviewing techniques to establish case conceptualizations that will increase the likelihood of client engagement in successful assimilations or accommodations of his or her schemas. So how are we helping them engage in change? That is first and second order change. And not only are they adhering to new information, but they're starting to apply it to their experience and they're adjusting their attitudes, their values, their beliefs in a productive way for their experience today. The individual's case formulation will take schema dynamics into account. So we're looking at what is the problem? Who is the person? What are their core goals and core values that this person holds? What will in, evolve in time? But with the schema dynamics, what has been part of their experience in their development that's led them to this place where they can see themselves in a certain way, they can see others in a certain way, and they view the world in a certain way? The problem may exist somewhere in between. And is it fact or is there room for adaptability or to adapt and adjust? What about self-exploration and answering the question of who is my true self? And with that, ultimately, where do I want to see myself and how do I envision my future recovery process? So this case conceptualization is used in practical application. There are some domains that you might want to consider when engaging in case conceptualization, and these domains include multicultural considerations, mental status, history of presenting systems symptoms, the presenting problem, what's the problem statement, what is the person, you know, why are they coming into treatment, their possible diagnosis, theoretical orientation, what style fits you best, what would fit the client best, how do you adapt that and change along the way. Treatment plan goals. So starting to list out the SMART goals that are long-term, short-term, looking at objectives, and objectives are just the action steps that are needed to help achieve these goals. And then, of course, review any legal or ethical considerations so that we can best prepare for safety planning and any other obligations such as confidentiality of PHI for individuals in our care. And as a case conceptualization related question, here's a discussion question I'd love to hear your thoughts on. How do you work with somebody who sees their own addiction as a series of poor choices or a failure of willpower? I'm just going to let you sit with that one for a second. So you might be thinking, yeah, Jen, we've learned case conceptualizations before. How is this unique to drug and alcohol treatment? With drug and alcohol treatment, case conceptualizations occur frequently. There's this interdisciplinary teaming that needs to occur, and I would encourage you to gain informed consent for supports, PCP, psychiatrists, loved ones, et cetera, so that we can all engage in a comprehensive plan with the individual that's going to be most effective for all involved with case conceptualizations. It's important to have a hypothesis about where we're going because drug and alcohol treatment does require a preliminary treatment plan at the time of assessment, and then if if you're in a state licensed agency, it's every 60 days after that, if not more often for more intensive levels of care. So if you're writing time-bound SMART goals well, you'll constantly be updating these together with the client. If the client doesn't seem to be making progress, we're probably conceptualizing something incorrectly. And we want to do our best to engage in collaborative treatment planning with individuals and allow treatment plans to act as a tool for the treatment process. Writing case consultations in client charts are also a big part of drug and alcohol treatment requirements per the state. So if we have to document times in which we're having discussion about this person's 
experience growth and change, which should be happening for every client that you're working with. And these might include just documenting conversations with your supervisors, peers, psychiatrists, anybody else who's on the treatment team. And generally this happens about every 90 days for most clients. So it is a lot of extra paperwork, but it's all for a very specific meaning to make sure that we are giving the client the most intentional care that we possibly can. Drug and alcohol treatment plans include problem statements, long-term and short-term goals, along with long-term and short-term objectives. And again, obje objectives should act as action plans to complete the goal for every goal. And there should be a target date with specific interventions which include modes and modalities. And this might look like evidence-based practices, theoretical orientations, individual groups, or concurrent psychiatric care. And so what's on this slide is just an example part of a treatment plan for a fictional client that I did at my workplace. So if you're working an internship now, or maybe you haven't seen a treatment plan yet, ask your supervisor what one for your agency might look like. They'll probably all follow a similar format, but look a little bit different here. Instead of using the objective language to be the action steps, we use interventions and activities. I, you know, I don't know. This is something that, you know, at least all the boxes are getting checked. We're just calling it different names. And you can see that I have a problem statement at the top that starts with the client's own words of cocaine is ruining my life. And this client's experience adverse consequences as a result of drug or alcohol use. And this is why this individual is coming to treatment. You can see this plan is individualized considering the specifics of the client's presentation, needs, and desires. And if I scrolled all the way down to the bottom and showed you the entire thing, you would see that it's pretty comprehensive as far as all of the objectives that we would be touching on because this client would be requesting them. So SMART goals, again, we want to make sure that it's specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, or relevant, and timely. And we want to start with asking, is that what you want to change? And what do you want to change? And how might you go about changing it? And how will you know if you've even reached that goal? And is it in your power to accomplish it? Can you realistically achieve it? Do you need help achieving it? When exactly do you want to accomplish it? All of these components with infused MI techniques will promote a healthy recovery process where treatment planning is no longer an oppressive extra paperwork thing that we have to do because of our job, but it becomes a tool for recovery process. So wrapping up, overall, the final thoughts here are how do we find our true selves when we're coming from a place of an experience of addiction and trauma and we're facing challenges of change today that will ultimately help us heal, but can be very difficult and can be very hurting for our soul as we need to come to terms with some of the things that have occurred in the past. And how does that not necessarily match who and what we are and what we value and what we want to be? That was a long sentence, um, but there's a lot of hope. And we can offer people a lot. We can instill key concepts and support them through these challenging times to get to that long-term goal. We just have to know where we're starting. Let me know if you have any thoughts, questions, comments, concerns. I'm really excited to see what discussions pop up. Thank you.